the story uh, about the U, about the SS, not Enterprise, the SS United States. Anybody heard of that before? Yeah. SS United States. Uh, it was commissioned in 1942 by the United States government to create the fastest uh, troop ship that we had in the fleet. There's a picture of it right now. Looks a lot like the Queen Mary, but that's what it what it is. When they made this vessel. They made it so large, so grand, so fast, that it was actually 990 feet long. It was larger than the Titanic. It was 101 feet wide, wide enough to only leave it two feet clearance on both sides as it could pass through the Panama Canal. It's 170 feet high, 175 feet high, which is as high as a 17 story building. It is the largest ship that was designed at that time. It's capable of going 44.7 knots. For those of you who don't know what a knot is, it equates to over 50 miles per hour on the water. It was so fast, it can go in reverse faster than the Titanic could go going forward. Still holds the record westward passing, uh, going west to cross the Atlantic Ocean. Still holds the record designed to carry 15,000 troops into battle and get anywhere within the world within 10 days and could go over 10,000 miles without having to refuel. This was the ultimate troop ship. The problem is, they never saw any action. The only time they got close to war was during the Bay of Pigs, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, where it was sitting offshore waiting. Now, what happened was it was so luxurious, so big, so fast. After all, it boasted three dining salons, three bars, two movie theaters, a heated pool. It was the first vessel that actually had air conditioning, five acres of deck space, seven miles of walkways inside of it. Then it became a luxury cruise line. What was designed for war became a luxury cruise liner. Now it's just off the side. Nobody really wants to restore it. They can't figure out what to do with it. And because they made it so luxurious, they had to wipe out some of the rooms because it wasn't really fitting for troops anymore and it wasn't fitting for those who actually wanted a, a luxurious cruise. So instead of carrying 15,000 troops into battle, it is just under 2,000 rooms now as a luxury cruise liner. One was designed to transport people into battle. One is designed to get people in comfort from point A to point B. And I'm just, just curious, just wondering, has the church become like the SS United States? Has what was designed by God to move troops into battle become nothing more than a luxury line getting Christians safely to death? See, when we start wanting our own comfort rather than the advancement of the kingdom, we are missing the purpose of who we are. When you start going from church to church based on your needs, I like the chairs in this church. I like the music in this church. I like the way the preacher preaches in this church. It's always me, me, me. What about me? I want, I want, I will, I will. We'll get into that kind of mentality in just a little bit. But when you go to church based on your comfort, rather than based on your commission, we've got a problem. Amen. And I think the church of Jesus Christ has got to stop worrying about my needs and recognize my job, according to the book of, according to the Bible, is to equip us for battle. Yes. Is to equip us for war. And if we're not engaging in this warfare, and we take spiritual warfare casually, then we'll become casualties in it. We're not just here to preach good words, good philosophy, good ways of teaching and living your life while the world is going to hell. No, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not be able to withstand the church's movement coming into battle. So I want to go back and understand what this spiritual warfare is. But Pastor Kobe, aren't we supposed to be talking about something positive? Yes, I am positive we need to engage in spiritual warfare. And why are we talking about this? Because you asked for it. So let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Ephesians. 
book of Ephesians chapter 6, and we'll start with 10 to 13, and we're going to see how much I actually finished today. The Bible says, a final word, be strong. Can we say it together? Say, be strong. Be strong. In the Lord and his mighty power, put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. The devil is actually planning and scheming and strategizing how to take you out. Okay? For we are not wrestling against flesh and blood enemies. It's not your neighbor. It's not your boss. It's not your ex-spouse. It's not the neighbor's dogs. It's not, it's not Donald or Hillary. Come on. Amen. But against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. Do you mean that we're fighting things we can't see? Yes. Against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Therefore, put on. In other words, you're in the fight. You're in it. So you might as well put it on. Every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. You mean evil's coming? Yep. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Friends, we are in a war. Now, we're not going to glorify the enemy today, but we are going to address some very specific things. And the Bible actually encourages us to look at this. In fact, Ephesians 5.11 says, Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. Some people today are taking part in evil deeds, and you don't even know it. We're doing it through our music. We're doing it through television. We're doing it through YouTube videos. We're doing it through the video games that we're playing. You'll be shocked, some of you wouldn't be, at the amount of occult symbolism that is involved in the video games that parents, you're buying your children and not even asking questions about. That's why in our household, we look at everything. I don't care if it's a video game. I don't care if it's music. What movie we're watching. We don't allow anything in the kingdom of darkness to come into my house. Why? Because I don't want the devil near me. I mean, if I'm going to have some spirit in my house, it's going to be the Holy Spirit. Come on. By the way, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit next week. Why? Because you asked for it. I tell you what, after having a brutal week of spiritual warfare, I need to preach about the Holy Ghost. Maybe this week I'll get my double dose of the Holy Ghost. And I'll preach myself into a good sermon. Woo! Amen. So, as we're getting involved in this, let's expose some things today and get rid of some of our unreal understanding or faulty reasoning. Can we do that? The first thing I want you to understand, number one, is that the devil is real. He's real. He's not a symbol. He's not a, 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 some kind of a metaphor. The Bible specifically says that the devil is an angel. Now, he's one of three angels that are actually named in our scriptures. There are some books that are not included in our Bible. There are some ancient texts that name other angels. But in our scripture, we only have three. We have Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer. Now, let me break these down for you real quick so you understand a little bit of angelology. You've got to be careful what the name means because a name is important. We'll talk about that in a second. Michael is, is, asks the question. We always say Michael is the warrior of God, right? right? That's a different one. Michael's name actually asks the question, who is like God? Okay? He is the guardian, the prince that's governing over Israel. Okay? Gabriel's name actually means the warrior of God. But I thought Gabriel was a messenger angel. Well, when does he show up to give a message? Only when he has the most important message to give to all. The Son of God is about to show up. And God sends his finest warrior to deliver the most powerful message, the weapon of mass destruction. Listen, Christmas is as much a declaration of war as it was redemption. God declared war on the enemy and said, I want to handle this myself. It is God's weapon of mass destruction. So what happened? Lucifer's name means light bearer. Light bearer. We're not sure a whole lot about what happens to this thing. We do know the Bible calls them a cherub. Cherubs aren't little naked babies with hearts. 
We always, I, that's why I don't let angels, we don't decorate with angels at our house. We don't, can we talk a little bit more? Yeah. Angels aren't little naked things. In fact, I have seen them. And people always say, I was talking to my guardian angel. Really? And here, we, yeah. I, but tell you, when you see one face to face, I understand why they fell as dead men. I'm just going to tell you flat out, we're going to get into angels later on during the few weeks to come. What happened? Well, somehow, we know that the devil was kicked out of heaven. The Bible tells us one part where it could possibly be is in Genesis 1-1 and in Genesis 1-2, the Bible says in 1-1, the opening line, that God created the heavens and the earth. 1-2 says, and the earth became void. Now, in your scriptures, it may say it was void, but the Hebrew actually says became void. Something happens where God creates everything, and then it becomes chaotic. And since God does not create things that are chaotic, people feel that's when the devil was cast down from heaven. We do not know a time period. We just know that when the author is writing it, it's trying to give us some kind of information. What we do know is that the book of Isaiah and the book of Ezekiel give us a little bit of understanding as to what's happening. So Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel 28, write those down. It's your homework to read for those of you who want a little more information. Isaiah 14, 12 to 21 says, How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn. How you were cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. For you said in your heart, I will ascend above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the amount of, the, of assembly near the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. I will, I will, I will. The devil never tried to be opposite God. He always tried to be like God. Okay? The Bible says, You were cast out away from the grave like a loathed branch clothed with the slain, those pierced by the sword who go down to the stones of a pit like a dead body trampled underfoot. Okay? It gets pretty, when the Lord deals with them, it's pretty severe. We're looking at the book of Ezekiel. The Lord is comparing, or the prophet is comparing, uh, the king of Tyre with the devil. And he makes a switch. He's talking about the king, and then all of a sudden he's talking about the devil. And it's kind of a parallel where we think that the devil was somehow massively influencing or possibly possessing this king. Because to compare a king to the devil, we have some interesting issues. Does that make sense? We have some kingly attributes, some humanly ones. And then all of a sudden we get a weird glimpse of the devil where he says, You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and exquisite beauty. This is Ezekiel 28, starting at verse 11, 12. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Your clothing was adorned with every precious stone, red carnelian, pale green peridot, white moonstone, beryl, onyx, jasper. And it goes down, down, down. I had ordained you and anointed you as the mighty angelic guardian. Some of your Bibles say cherub. You had access to the holy mountain of God and walked amongst the stones of fire. It's giving a picture of who this is. You were blameless in all you did from the day you were created until the day evil was found in you. The devil is real. From this, we learn that he does not have a red skin-tight jumpsuit, does not have a tail, does not have horns, and he does not have Trident's pitchfork. Right? We see a very different picture of what the devil looks like. But I want to tell you today, for sure, you better understand this. The devil is real. But should we fear the devil? I don't think so. Jesus says in Luke, I saw Satan fall like lightning. Like lightning. Like God just done. Get out of here. We do get some information, though, in the book of Revelation. Let's throw that Bible verse up. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 and 9. There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. And the dragon, the dragon lost the battle. Come on. Yeah. He lost. He, he and his angels were forced out of heaven. This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown into hell? No. To the earth with all of his angels. It preaches really good to start shouting and say, 
There's not a devil in hell that can come against you. That's not necessarily the case. Okay, they're, they're thrown down to earth. That's, you know what I mean? Sometimes we're going to get some, some good theology. Now what else do we know? John 12, 31 calls the devil the ruler of this world. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says that he is the God, little g, of this age. Ephesians 2, 2, he is the prince of the power of the air. 1 John 5, 19 says the world around us is under the control of the evil one. The devil is real. Number two, the devil is at war with us. Just because you don't believe it doesn't mean it's real. He is at war with you. And one of the greatest gifts that I can give you today is for you to understand that what you've been feeling and sensing is true. There have been moments, opportunities, times in your life when you have been strategically attacked by the devil. And you know it's true. There are moments when you think, man, if one more thing happens to me, and it does. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter 5, verses 8 through 9, Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for somebody to devour. So stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. The devil prowls like a roaring lion. Anybody see how a lion attacks something? It doesn't just come out prancing. I'm about to kill you. It doesn't come out like that. It creeps. It creeps. It creeps. And it gets by a herd. What does it do? It roars. Does it go after the fastest gazelle? No. It goes after the one that's weak, that's sick, and usually the one that darts out from the pack. Yep. Friends, that's why it's important for you to stay in church. Because the devil picks off the ones who walk away from the group. And he will roar and scare Is a roar going to kill you? Is a roar going to chase you? So it will roar and see which one freaks out and take that one out. Don't ever be afraid when the lion roars. Because the lion of Judah is inside of you. Okay, But that's he attacks you. And he'll tempt you. Matthew 4, Luke 4, the devil goes after Jesus. Goes after Jesus. And then it says, he left him for a more opportune time. The devil is looking for the opportunity to attack. And he'll lie in wait for the right moment. The next thing I want you to know is that the devil does have power. He does. But you have a lot to do with how much power he has in your life. Give an example. Ephesians 4, uh, verses 26 and 27, it talks about anger, not spiritual warfare, but it does give us a good glimpse of what's going on. It says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Now, I know we're talking about anger, but it's saying, don't let that unresolved issue stay in your life. When you do, you leave the window cracked open. You leave the door open. You allow that unresolved issue or that unresolved sin in your life to let the devil come in and put his teeth into you or his hooks into you. So a lot of people can't figure out why they can't get their breakthrough. It's because they never cut the sin out of their life. You come off drugs, but you still hang out with all your druggy friends. Come on. You keep that door open. You have anger in your life, and instead of dealing with the anger, you just walk away from the situation. But you've never dealt with the anger. And so that's that open door for the devil to be able to come in. Are you with me? Yeah. yeah. So we don't let the devil come in. Don't allow the situations in your life to give the devil the ability to stay with you. Now, this is all bad news. You start thinking about it. Man, the devil's real. The devil has a plan against my life. The devil has power. Do we have any good news? I do. Because the fourth thing I want you to know is the devil is subject to our God. He's subject to our God. He trembles at the sight of our God. He trembles at the name of Jesus. And when we align ourselves with what God is doing, do we align ourselves with the victorious lifestyle that God has called us to live? 1 John 4.4 4 says, You dear children, you mission church, are from God and have Overcome. Somebody say overcome. overcome. 
Because the one who is in you is greater than the one that is in the world. Amen. Give the Lord a clap for that. Come on. I am so tired of this Halloween season. Everybody talking about the devil showing. There's a new TV show called Lucifer. Greater is he that is in you than any devil you may face, any kind of demonic influence in your life. The power of God is flowing through you. That's why we were singing songs about that earlier today. We don't run and hide. We're not a fear. Because at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Many Christians overlook or dismiss the fact that there is a, uh, a supernatural world. We do. We, we, we want more philosophy than anything else. But don't ever underestimate the power of the supernatural in your life. Okay? I can tell you that right now what's going on in this country is not physical, it's supernatural. Okay? Um, I believe that what's happening uh, in this election, first of all, we should repent that this is the best two options that we have for president. Okay? Uh, as a church, we need to repent because we have remained silent on biblical issues. Okay. And when you remain silent, there will always be a vacuum. Something will fill it. Okay. There's been an assault on our children. Anybody ever ask any questions as to why all of a sudden all these supernatural superhero movies have come out? We're programming our children to believe in supernatural, perhaps mutant powers. Even X-Men Apocalypse. The main villain says, some people call me Elohim, Yahweh. Is, is it just me? Why are there so many zombie movies coming out? They're brainwashing our children. And the church has said, they don't need that, they don't need that, they don't need that, and Hollywood's feeding it, feeding it, feeding it. What's happening right now in the elections, I'm telling you, is spiritual. So we fight it the way we should, on our knees. Not in submission, but in prayer. We need to. So how do we fight? How does the Lord want us to fight? Well, the Bible tells us that although we are in the world... We do not wage war in a worldly way. Because the weapons that we use to wage war are not worldly. We're not going to drag people in the mud on social media. Come on. We don't fight the way the world does. The world destroys people on social media. The world destroys things through the, the news media. The world destroys people talking behind their back. We don't fight that way, do we? Not as children of God. On the contrary, they have God's power to demolish strongholds. Demolish strongholds. Things in your life that ensnare you. Things in your life that hold you back. What does the Bible say to do? Destroy them. Demolish them. Annihilate them. A lot of people want to come to church and do a kumbaya Christianity. Yeah. Let's just love each other. I hate to say it, we have a church full of gracists. Everything's just covered by grace. It's all grace. I can live like hell because it's grace. I can still go to heaven because it's grace. That's not grace, it's mercy. But I hear that all the time. It's just grace. God's grace. I just plead God's grace. Friends, it's time that the church of Christ, yes, we believe in grace. But the Bible says to destroy the stronghold. How do we destroy them? I'm glad you asked. Number one, we fight with the name of Jesus. This name represents an identity. Names have power. Cancer. Debt. Divorce. Sickness. Disease. Addiction. Depression. There's power in that name. And a name identifies what it is and what's to come, does it not? But no matter what name you may be fighting with right now, the Bible says there's a name above every other name, and his name is Jesus. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. The Bible says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. 
At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. In heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Come on, that's three levels right there. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Somebody clap for that. So how in the world, what are we supposed to do? The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So how do we call on the name of the Lord? See, a lot of people pray to Jesus. You don't pray to Jesus. You pray to God the Father in the name of Jesus by being imparted or inspired by the Holy Ghost. Okay? That's how you pray to the Father. Now, some of you right now are struggling with issues. You're dealing with bondages right now. It could be generational. It could be a curse. Is that even real? Listen, do prayers pray to God, right? Pray, pray prayers to God. If you're going to speak evil over somebody's life, it's called a curse. To speak evil over somebody. It's real. Sometimes it's generational. But I think it's time we start breaking some things off of us yeah. right now. Rather than wait for an altar call. Can I pray a general prayer right now over all of us? <laughs> now, I'm going to pray. And as I'm going through this, I don't want to embarrass anybody if you're dealing with this. But I'm going to pray a spiritual, supernatural prayer that will not be cute, but it's going to be demolishing. Can we do that right now? Here we go. Are you ready to pray with me? Because we're going to break some things off of us right now. Amen. Heavenly Father, I come to you now in Jesus' name to repent of all the sins in my life and the lives of my ancestors. I repent of all disobedience, rebellion, mistreatment of others, lying, cheating, using or slandering of your name in vain. And I repent of all perversion, lust, fornication, adultery, idolatry, witchcraft, and any occult involvement. Lord Jesus, I now take authority that you've given me and ask that you anoint me as I go and command all demonic spirits of anger, rage, fear, depression, destruction, torment, guilt, bondage, rejection, unforgiveness, bitterness, double-mindedness, confusion, passivity, sickness, Diseases, pain, all addictions to food, alcohol, drugs, sex, pornography, gambling, and nicotine to come out in Jesus' name. No demonic spirit is welcome in this place. I break all spiritual bondage that may have been performed over my life and anything resulting in the involvement through Ouija boards, psychics, tarot cards, horoscopes, music, TV. Movies, video games, or pornography. I break all bondage off me and my family. I break every shackle, every chain, every habit, every craving, debt, soul ties, and any spirit that has tried to steal, kill, or destroy my life. And I command my family to be set free. I break every demonic assignment over my family. Satan, loose them now in Jesus' name. I am a child of God through Jesus Christ. I cast down all the demonic forces that come against me or my family's lives. I am not cursed, but I am blessed. I am blessed coming in. I am blessed going out. I am above, not beneath. I am the head, not the tail. I am blessed, and what God has blessed, nothing can curse. I am free. I am saved. And I now exercise my faith and know that my confession is made unto the obedience of Jesus Christ and salvation. My sins are forgiven and I am loosed from the curse that is a result of disobedience and rebellion to the word of God. Thank you, Father, for forgiving me and loving me. I thank you for setting me free from every form of evil that has operated in my life. Father God, I pray for discernment and for a new vision to help me recognize and resist all evil and all fleshly worldly ways. I am anointed through Jesus Christ. And I thank you, Jesus, for your guidance and discipline as I continue to be a victorious soldier and your child. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Pastor, that's pretty violent. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it. Amen. 
Number two, the weapon is the Word of God. The Word of God. Hebrews 4.12 tells us that the Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. The Word of God has power. The Bible says that it's a sword and it's the only weapon that we use to fight the enemy in the book of Ephesians. Stand your guard, stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared. In addition, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Hold on a second. The arrows of the devil? You mean he's not even want to fight me Face to face? He's going to stand afar off and shoot little arrows at me. Bing, bing, bing. You know why? Because the Bible says that the sword is the word of God and the devil can't handle the word of God. So he doesn't want to be hit by the word of God. So he stands back like a coward from afar shooting darts at you. And the only way to stop it is to lift your shield of faith and stop it and stop it and stop it. Come on. Your faith. Your faith. What you believe. That's why it's important that you know what you believe. This Bible has the legal rights that you have as a believer. But if you don't activate it, it doesn't work. If I give you a million bucks, it doesn't work until you cash the check. It doesn't mean you don't have it. It just means you haven't cashed it. Cash it in. This is your last will and testament of Jesus Christ. If it's in here, I want it. I want to behave like it. I want to act like it. Pastor, that's not really normal for Christianity today. Right. Which is why we don't see things like the book of Acts anymore. That's right. Because we've watered this down to meet the needs of society. And the reality is, if I just do it God's way, everything will be taken care of. So when I read the Bible, I want to read the scripture verses and make them neat for me. What do I mean by that? Make it personal. Let me give you an example. When I'm making something personal, like Luke chapter 10, verse 19, I'll say, I have authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt me. When I look at Romans uh, 8, 35 to 37, what shall separate me from the love of Christ? I am more than a conqueror who him who loves me. Mark 9, 23, all things are possible if I believe. Isaiah 53, 5, by his stripes, I am healed. I make it personal. And when you make the word of God personal, it becomes a weapon against the enemy. Just be careful when you use the word as a weapon that you don't turn it on your fellow Christian. Okay. Just saying. And number three is the power of the cross. The power of the cross of Jesus Christ is a weapon that we use. See, a lot of people just think Jesus died for your sins. He did. But there was also something else that was happening on the cross. The world would say, and I've heard it preached, good sermons, bad theology. And for three days, Jesus descended into hell and he wrestled with the devil. And after three days, he came out victorious. You all heard those sermons? Yeah. Do you really think the Son of God has to fight the devil? In the book of Revelation, we read it. Who handles the devil? Michael. He got, got to even handle himself. He sends an angel after it. You take care of this one. So what was happening? The Bible says that Jesus descended because there were authority issues that had to be resolved. In the garden, God gives man authority. Man sins gives authority to the devil. And when Jesus is being tempted... The devil even tells Jesus, I'll give you the authority if you just bow to me. Jesus doesn't argue with it. Doesn't argue with it. The Bible says he descends. And he took the keys to death, hell, and the grave, and then he ascended. Why is that important? Because the devil doesn't even have the keys to his own house. Okay. Jesus took it and is now in control of your destiny. I love this. Revelation 1.18. I am he who lives I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. amen. I love it. He amens himself. He's preaching. He amens himself. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Yes. 
The cross didn't just cover your sins. It conquered death. Revelation 12, 11. They defeated him by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. How do we defeat him? Through the cross of Jesus Christ and your testimony. So Shalom comes back. What's your story? For me, my story, I grew up in a preacher's home. Learned how to do the church thing. Loved God as much as I could. Been so damaged by church folk that I didn't really want anyone to go to the church anymore. Amen. Be real. Amen. Told God, I don't want to be a preacher. Don't, I'll do anything, just don't want me to preach. <laughs> I love you, but your people are crazy. But the Lord got a hold of me. Gave me an encounter I could not walk away from. So when I tell you things that I've seen in the spirit, visions, yes. What's the difference between a vision and a dream? One's when you're awake and one's when you're asleep. You guys be real with you guys? Both are real. And I've had them experience them. Angels have seen them. People possessed them. Been there, done that, check that box. How'd you know they were possessed? Well, when their eyes were rolling back and they started growling and doing things, that was a pretty good indication one time. I mean, this is real. So we talk about demonic possession. Why don't we just talk about being possessed by the Holy Ghost? Yes. Think about it. Amen. Why do we accept one and not the other? Yes. I know for those of you who knew, I'm just preaching straight. Somebody has to in America. my rebellion, I watch people coming out of wheelchairs. Okay, God, this is cool. I'll preach, but I just don't want to get involved anymore than that. Your people are too crazy. And then I realized, why in the world am I getting upset walking away from a calling to minister to the people that Jesus died for? I'm telling you from experience what it's like to have the devil plant something in your brain that you think is God or godly counsel, or godly wisdom. And then he realized the devil had tried to steal, kill, and destroy my future. Had I listened and just been a good board member, a good Sunday school teacher, went into business and made a lot of money, if I would have just done that, how many lives would not be in the kingdom of God? I could have justified it and been great. People would never have known until judgment day when I stood before the Lord he said, what did you do in light of what I called you to do? Oh, friends, we're not just judged by what you do with Jesus. We're also judged based on what we were called to do. We'll get into that in a couple weeks. Why? Because you asked for it. But I just want to ask you guys a question. Are you ready to fight? Some of you are looking at me saying, Pastor, I have quoted scripture. I've pleaded the blood. I have called on the name of the Lord and I'm still right in the middle of hell itself. I know. It happens. I don't make light of it at all. Not at all. But just because you're in a fight does not mean that God doesn't love you. In fact, I've learned in my life the fight is the most severe when the devil is most scared. So if you're in a fight, can I just tell you, rejoice because you're scaring the devil. Friends, let's engage in the fight. Our job here is to equip you to do the work of the ministry. Yes, we want to make sure that we're doing it in ways that meets your unique needs. It meets the needs of Riverside, meets the needs of families. But let's always remember, the purpose of what we're doing is to change eternity. And if all we do is leave going, that was a good sermon, Pastor. Woo! We fail. We want to walk out of here going, I'm in a fight and I will fight. I will fight for my family. I will fight for my friends. I will fight for my neighbors. Because eternity is at stake. The greatest stake in the history of anything that's ever been. Life and death, eternity. Let's pray. Father, I think for those here, who have needed to engage in a fight 
And I ask that right now you move on their hearts for those who are saying, man, I, I'm not even living right. I can't do this right. I need to get right with you. If there's anybody here today, anybody here, where this message resonated with you, and you need to get right with Jesus, just raise your hand. Don't be looking around. Just if you want to get right with Jesus, just raise your hand. I'm going to pray a prayer. And because the Bible does not give a clear-cut direction as far as repeat after me, blah, 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 I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and I want you to pray it to yourself. Pray it to God, but pray it in your own words. Just say, Father, I know I'm a sinner, and I know I need you. I thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sins. And I receive you now as the Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sins. I want to be made right with you. And now, Lord, I ask that you fill me with your Holy Spirit. Show me how to fight right. Show me how to fight with the weapons that you've given me. And let me make a difference in the lives of those around me. In Jesus' name, amen.